We'd like to welcome you all to uh, the second session of the conference. My name is Jed Woodworth, and I'll be chairing this session. Uh, we've got uh, some wonderful panelists on this session. Melissa Inouye teaches Chinese history at uh, the University of Auckland. And I just refer to all the bios at the, uh, at the end. I'm not going to read all the bios. Kate Holbrook, it, she uh, writes history and women's history uh, at the LDS Church History Department. David Holland uh, teaches at the Harvard Divinity School. Laurie Mathley Kipp teaches and writes. Uh, well, I guess all these people are writers, right? Um, at Washington University of St. Louis. And uh, it doesn't save us in the bio <clears throat> but the, all three of our presenters have a Harvard connection. We have two, two of them, Melissa and Kate, were graduate students at Harvard. David teaches at Harvard. Um, oh, we have a Yale, Yale, Yale Lee. Uh, Larry Mathieu Kipp went to Yale, so there's some friction, tension here on the panel. But also, we'd like to uh, see if the Harvard Crimson comes out, if we can find a common thread in the three presenters. So. With that, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, have Melissa come. Thank you very much for, um, for inviting me. I'm so honored to be part of this conference. Actually, I know that it was just affirmative action. There's too much hair on this panel. <laughs> so as a scholar in Chinese history, Mormon topics rarely come up in my class unless you count the Taiping Rebellion, which was started in 1851 by a guy who saw God in Jesus Christ and who led rebel armies that contemporary observers sometimes called Mormonites. Um, but Mormonism shapes how I teach Chinese history. So this happens in three ways. First, Mormonism's hierarchical pastoral structures inform my approach to the student-teacher relationship. Second, Mormonism's doctrines of the eternal value of learning guide my understanding of why and what I teach. Third, living as a Latter-day Saint has made me comfortable with messiness. When I teach Chinese history, I teach it all, the good, the bad, the inspiring, and the despicable. So first, in embracing my role as a teacher as opposed to an educational service provider, which is what new corporate universities think we are nowadays, I follow in the footsteps of my Uncle Dylan and Uncle Charles. Um, Dylan Kazuyuki Inoue, who passed away in 2008, was famous in the Instructional Psychology and Technology Department at BYU. He taught legendary speed reading classes in which it was clear that the main objective was not really learning to read fast, but absorbing provocative perspectives from books like Seren Kierkegaard's Works of Love or Michio Kaku's Hyperspace. Charles Shiro Inoue, uh, who teaches at Tufts University, based his new recent book, uh, creatively titled The End of the World, Plan B, on um, his undergraduate seminar with the same title. So this book grew out of his conversations with students. So here I am paying my respects to my uncles, not only to name role models, but also to establish a fundamental premise about teaching, which is that teaching relationships are hierarchical relationships. Now in liberal Western discourse, we tend to see hierarchy as a negative word, but the model of an Asian extended family in which older generations receive deference and give care shows how vertical relationships can nurture human flourishing. As children within a Japanese American family and a, and a Chinese American family, my cousins and I were conditioned to assume that aunts, uncles, or grandparents had something to give and we had something to receive. Actually, I'm very touched that my aunties are all sitting in this row. Thank you for coming. This differential creates powerful obligations. To be a teacher, as in the case of being a parent or an aunt, is to take responsibility for knowing some, someone and knowing their needs. Now, Mormonism is a theological and cultural system built on hierarchical relationships. In its early years, this hierarchy unsettled many antebellum Protestants who felt that Mormon prophets, patriarchs, and priests were despotic in the tradition of um, their vision of Roman Catholicism or Islam. And today, as Jana pointed out in the earlier session, um, hierarchism within Mormon administrative structures can lead to a top-down, my way or the highway approach to leadership that is limited by the absence of a meaningful range of different perspectives. And yet one thing that can be said for hierarchical relationships is that in both a Confucian and a Mormon context, the power to influence comes with many strings attached. Stewardship has a deep and multivalent meaning, 
and one fundamental premise is that authority means work. Within local congregations, as within multi-generational families, the deeply personal context of hierarchy softens power differentials and strengthens channels of communication. A student-teacher relationship is hierarchical, but also reciprocal. Students are obligated to listen to prepare to rise to challenges. Teachers are obligated to be worthy of this receptiveness through careful preparation. I vividly remember the first class that I ever taught as an adjunct at Cal State LA. It was on the Shang Dynasty, a topic about which I knew nothing, but of course they asked me to teach it. Um, <coughs> this vast swath of time, all of that distant from the 20th century history that I knew best. So I made an outline, I got up, I stood in front of the class planning to lecture from the outline. But when the students took their seats and I began to speak, I realized that I actually knew nothing beyond the course of the thin little row of bullet points running down the page. As I watched the students taking notes, writing down what I was saying in my mind, I was screaming, don't write that down, it's garbage! <laughs> this was a definitive moment in my teaching career, a moment in which I felt the weight of my obligations. Now, a student-teacher relationship involves vulnerability on the part of the students. Now, in the worst case scenario, as in the case of my first class fiasco, this is dangerous because what the teacher has to offer may not be worthy, may even be wrong or harmful. In the best case scenario, however, vulnerability is a carefully prepared seedbed that can produce optimal yields. This same conscientious preparation takes place in a Mormon context as we publicly sustain and internally commit to support our leaders at all levels and accept their roles as teachers. Why is it that children watching General Conference are shushed to attention when Thomas S. Monson, the prophet, comes to the pulpit? His talks are not as engaging as Dieter F. Uchtdorf's, nor as clearly structured as those of Dallin H. Oaks. President Monson comes across as a kind man who tells stories tinged with a mixture of sentiment and admonition, all in a very soothing cadence. Hearts were touched, tears were shed. And yet when everyone sits up and tries very hard to learn something from President Monson because he is the prophet, we very often do remember what he says, which is more than I can say for many, a, a few conference talks which have the tendency to blur together. This fruitful receptiveness is born of the hierarchical student-teacher relationship. Now the other side of this coin, of course, is the problem of this vulnerability being disproportionate with regard to gender. Currently, the church's hierarchical structure is di directly linked to priesthood ordination. There are no roles within our centralized structure in which women are formally set apart as stewards over the entire membership, global or local, men and women. In other words, no man in the church is religiously obligated to recognize a woman as a spiritual authority from whom he must take counsel. This cannot help but affect how Mormon men think about women and how Mormon women think about themselves. But despite the potential for imbalance and abuse, my Mormon experience has given me a perspective on the positive potential of hierarchical relationships, which inform my relationship with students. Good teaching is a personal obligation. Second, uh, in how Mormonism affects my teaching. My expectations for what the students learn in my class are directly influenced by the Mormon paradigm in which learning is the very purpose of mortal life and an eternal characteristic, an eternal aptitude. Even secular learning from chemistry to home renovation expands our capacity and brings us closer to our divine potential. As suggested by the revelation in Mormon scripture that says we are to seek out of the best books words of wisdom, seek learning even by study and also by faith. The realm in which human beings acquire knowledge and skills overlaps with the realm in which we realize our divine nature. Hence, in my mind, I haven't succeeded as a professor of Chinese history unless I've helped the students to see the connection between the study of history and vital, ongoing issues in their own lives. Their lives are incredibly busy and pressurized, a whirlwind of doors to countless futures that are constantly swinging open and banging shut. In such an environment, it is easy to adopt a strategic mindset to compartmentalize getting ahead and being good. This is why they plagiarize essays from the internet. And yet the two processes have unfold within a shared space. It is impossible for one not to influence the other. In the final lecture of a course, I always seek to extend the lessons of history into the lives of the students. So in a last lecture on October 14th, 2014, I told my modern Chinese history class a story of my days as a lowly PhD student um, researching the True Jesus Church in Nanjing, China. So now you all have to pretend like you're 19 year olds in New Zealand because I'm going to quote from my lecture. I'm quoting here. 
During this time in Nanjing, I was visited by an older academic who it turned out was also writing a book on the true Jesus Church. I felt quite protective of my research findings. I decided it wouldn't be a problem to help him find the way to the chapel. I would translate for him, but to share my best quotes, my hard-won insights with this competitor would be the professional equivalent of shooting myself in the foot. Who would be impressed by a book that didn't have new, rare, original material? I emailed my advisor for her perspective. Maybe there was some sort of strategic framework widely known to seasoned academics to guide how much information I could share and how much I should keep to myself. My advisor, Henrietta Harrison, is an accomplished scholar and a wonderful person. In her reply, she said, I think that scholars should be generous with their scholarship just as they are with anything else. This was a revelation. It wasn't necessary to adopt a new set of values in order to succeed professionally. One's basic values can and should be applied everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're sharing research materials or sharing your lunch. Sometimes when we feel unsure of our own abilities, we feel that honesty or generosity are luxuries that we cannot afford. In fact, the simple act of treating others as you would want to be treated will pay huge, pay huge dividends and make you better at what you do. You can now return from New Zealand and age a few years. I'm not quoting from my lecture anymore. Uh, the third point of my talk. Um, I teach students that history is messy. Modern Chinese history is full of lofty, inspired ideals and ugly, horrific acts. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should take my class. My students ask me, how do you feel about China? When I was younger, my feelings about China were unambiguous. First, I loved China for its great expanse, its incredible continuity over millennia, and of course, its street food. Then, after learning more about its modern history, I scorned China for its strong men, its corruption, its repressive state. Over the years, however, my thinking about China has become more complex. Now, this shift in my thinking has actually corresponded with a parallel shift in my own understanding of Mormonism. And if you look at the history of the Chinese Communist Party, you see it's not far off from the recent history of the LDS Church in terms of the problems that arise when charismatic ideals are harnessed to human organizations. With this coupling, there is great locomotive potential, but also potential for mutual encumbrance. Mormon history, is too, too, is full of problems, as ordinary people struggled with the extraordinary task of building the kingdom of God on earth. It was exhilarating work, characterized by cooperation, consecration, and inspiration, but also by controversy and some serious sketchiness. Amasa Lyman, one of Brigham Young's fellow apostles, later conceded of early attempts to practice plural marriage, quote, we obeyed the best we knew how and, no doubt, made many crooked paths in our ignorance, close quote. Over time, Latter-day Saints have struggled to overcome prevailing cultural beliefs, political pressures, and what the Book of Mormon calls the natural man, to realize Zion, the community of the pure in heart. Often, we fail. As I have studied Mormon history and thought hard about the meaning of Mormon community, I have become convinced that the Japanese philosopher Nishida Kitaro was right when he argued that the nature of reality is contradiction. Contradictions, as we encounter them in history and theology, in word and in deed, signify that something is real. We sometimes feel disillusioned when we discover imperfection or even corruption within grand enterprises that are supposed to transcend mundane human life. But every revolutionary or inspiration inspired project must also be a human project, and human beings are as unreliable and disappointing as they are beautiful and worthwhile. In another final lecture for a modern Chinese history class, I raise this issue of contradictions. So here again, you return to your 19-year-old New Zealand self. When I was a Mormon missionary in Tainan, Taiwan, many years ago in the early mornings, I often went running along a road. The road ran past a rice factory, a huge metal shed full of bags and bags of rice. As you can imagine, all of that rice in a big industrial space attracted rats. So the road outside the rice factory was splotched with flattened rats that had been run over by passing cars. The hot sun dried them out, so they kept their shapes down to little wiggly coils of intestine, perfectly flat, looped on the blacktop. In the early mornings, my fellow missionaries and I went running along this canal road. And one morning, I was running along the segment by the rice factory. And next to the rice factory, it was a breakfast shop. As I ran past, I was smelling these wonderful smells of shrimp dumplings and scallion pancakes, feeling the cool breeze, feeling a nice, clean, sweaty feeling, feeling completely joyful about where I was and what I was doing at that moment. At that moment, 
I glanced down and saw that my foot was plunging down onto a big, fat, freshly exploded rat. This experience taught me a lesson. Very few things are all good and not bad, or the other way around. Everything is mixed up together. So now I'm returning to him. You can leave New Zealand. As a scholar and as a Latter-day Saint, I don't value tidiness in history and self-definition as much as I used to. In my mind, the tensions that complicate the collective execution of divine mandates are not glaring and um, do not signify that the whole project is the best, but authentically reflect how the children of God strive to make difficult choices. My first encounter with Richard and Claudia Bushman was when I, in 2003, I went to visit them at their home in New York City. I asked them what it was like to be Mormon academics at Columbia. And Richard responded, we're interpreters. This notion of interpretation, moving between languages, cultures, and epistemological paradigms has helped to define my understanding of a scholar's job ever since. As historians, our job is to learn to inhabit multiple worlds and to translate between them so that we and others can understand the meaning and worth of the lives of our fellow beings. Today's world of conflict, fragmentation, and polarization needs such interpreters. As people accustomed to traversing spaces in between, Mormon academics can make an important contribution as they train others to think critically, expansively, and constructively, to build bridges in a peopled world that difference has made dangerous, wondrous, and divine. Stories matter, and they matter in complicated ways. The tradition of the Latter-day Saints attributes salvific qualities to history. Often we think of history's saving qualities in terms of providing accurate records of events and a means to perform ordinances in temples on behalf of the dead. This paper explores the ways that the dead can also save the living. Latter-day Saints acknowledge this in our emphasis on scripture reading, but I would like to focus on non-scriptural saving voices. When we study history, we give our ancestors the opportunity to save us as well. History can inspire us to action, either to acknowledge and provide a chance for healing from past wrongs, or to build on past rights. For the dead to save us, some of us have to preserve and publish an accurate and inclusive range of their stories, and all of us have to read them. When church members do family history, they try to uncover the names of deceased ancestors to provide ordinances for them in the temple. This is the way we typically think about our relationship with the dead in the work of salvation. The efforts are about justice, the hope that every person ever born will have the opportunity to choose salvation. Mercha Eliada's work may have fallen out of fashion, but LDS temples certainly do fit his description of a holy place where time and space collapse. Temples are a vibrant nexus where past and present, living and dead, and the wishes of both come into sacred alignment. Often family history researchers report feeling guided by the dead in their work. A senior missionary at the church history library where I work, for example, reports feeling spiritual promptings almost daily as she searches for biographical information about the dead who appear in church historians' press book projects. The family researcher I mentioned is not working explicitly to identify names for temple work. She works to provide accurate records of past lives to preserve and share their stories. Telling people's stories can be powerful no matter your religious philosophy. In his biopic of C.S. Lewis, screenwriter William Nicholson had Lewis say, quote, we read to know that we are not alone, close quote. Many of us recognize truth in Nicholson's assertion. Others' stories can help us to make sense of our own lives and experiences. They comfort us. We also find significant meaning in having our stories told. And Isaac Denison wrote a particularly beautiful illustration of this, recalling the time when she would read and write documents for her neighbors in Kenya, who could neither read nor write on their own. She described one man in particular, Jogona Kanyaga, 
who was involved in a legal dispute that required he submit a written account of his side of the story. Kanyaga told his account to Dinason, who read it back to him after she wrote it down. Hearing a written version of his own experience, Dinason reported this was his reaction, open quote, he swiftly turned to face me and gave me a great, fierce, flaming glance, so exuberant with laughter that it changed the old man into a boy. Such a glance did Adam give the Lord when he formed him out of the dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Kanyaga fashioned and embroidered a small leather pouch to contain the account Dinason had written, and he wore it around his neck all the time. Occasionally on a Sunday morning, he would appear at her door and ask her to read it to him again. Dinason then took the importance of storytelling a step further as she related his story. She often experimented with biblical characters and verses in her writing. And in the following lines, her formulation inverts the flesh and word from its biblical precedent. Open quote, here was something which Jogona Kanyaga had performed and which would preserve his name forever. The flesh was made word and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. The New Testament describes Jesus' birth as the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Perhaps she meant to play with that image of birth, that making the flesh word is a new way of being, and that this new way of being exudes grace and truth. Referencing Christ's birth as she does also links words and stories with salvation. Jesus was not complete without flesh, and we humans are not complete when our life stories go untold. Dinason and I may not be doing exactly the same kind of work, but this is the work that historians do to preserve the names and deeds of those who have come before. Kanyaga first turned to the written word in pursuit of legal Kanyaga first turned to the written word in pursuit of legal justice. Historians too can be preoccupied with justice. Brett Rushforth feels an ethical obligation to the human subjects of his books. O open quote, particularly the enslaved, he emphasizes, whose lives were spent trying to assert and insist on their full humanity in the face of a brutal attempt to commodify them. In the introduction to a book, he explained the this worldly justice such depictions might achieve. Open quote, if their lives are useful because they illuminate the systems through which they passed, their value is intrinsic, close quote. Rushforth thus suggests that stories can emphasize a narrative the dead tried to tell, can humanize the dead, and can correct against the institutions and patterns that tyrannized them while they lived. 19th century Latter-day Saints felt keenly a yearning for historical records to bring justice. While in Liberty Jail, Joseph Smith wrote a letter to his followers, it's Doctrine and Covenants 123, asking them to record all that had befallen them, including perpetrators' names. He wanted official statements and affidavits. Open quote, it is an imperative duty that we owe to God, to angels, with whom we shall be brought to stand, and also to ourselves, to our wives and children, to the widows and fatherless whose husbands and fathers have been murdered. And also it is an imperative duty that we owe to all the rising generation and to all the pure in heart to keep these records. In 1830, he announced the creation of the position of church historian. So that's the same year the church began. And the church historian was to combat false reports and to convert and edify future generations. Historical records were to heal and redeem saints from the effects of patterns that tyrannized them while they lived. Specific violence against women in Missouri has recently captured public attention, and the most solid evidence for that violence came from affidavits. Some commentators have imagined that knowledge of 19th century saints overcoming sexual violence might offer healing for victims of that kind of violence today. In recent decades, Mormon historians have also made a concerted effort to tell the stories of those whom Mormons have harmed, most notably in the study of massacre at Mountain Meadows, in which local Cedar City church leaders were responsible for the deaths of 120 people traveling through Utah during their emigration from Arkansas to California in 1857. 
We have also contributed to construction of the Circleville Monument, dedicated April 26, 2016, to acknowledge a massacre by Mormon settlers of approximately 30 Paiute men, women, and children 150 years earlier in 1866. Accurate records uncover a truer understanding of what has happened in the past to inform our institutional precedents and individual actions today. How we tell the stories also matters. Professional historians who are also members of the church, so professional historians who are also members of the church feel a distinctive obligation to the dead they study. One of the great perils that comes from being not only a historian of Mormons, but a Mormon historian is the specter that we might meet on the other side, someone we have written about. Historians are not the only ones who face this scenario. I have seen church leaders' efforts to honor their institutional predecessors through their words and through policy. Our representations of those who came before is one of the ways we seek to honor the dead. And thanks to Grant Wacker's excellent lecture last weekend at the Mormon History Association, I have a quotation from Richard Bushman on the same theme. And Bushman is quoted as saying, someday we will meet in heaven the people we write about. And when we do, we will have to look them in the eye and account for ourselves. Have we told their story as fairly as we know how? Have we told their story without distorting it in order to serve our own agendas? Recently, I only narrowly avoided a grave error in this regard. My colleague Jennifer Reeder and I have compiled a collection of discourses by Mormon women to be published by the Church Historians Press next March. One of the talks is by Judy Brummer, a woman born and raised in South Africa who was the first adept Kosa-speaking missionary uh, in South Africa. When she arrived on her mission, she met a man named Goliat Kawa. Kawa had come across an LDS pamphlet, and based on that pamphlet, had founded a church among black Africans that consisted of several congregations, hundreds of people. He took Brummer and other missionaries to these congregations and taught his followers that they needed to be rebaptized because he had not baptized them by the correct priesthood. This seemed to me a tremendous sacrifice, as is consonant with the churches Kawa and his followers would have known. Church members provided a living for Kawa and his family. I find it astonishing that he so readily introduced members of his church to missionaries of the official Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and thereby gave up his livelihood. The only space I had to devote to Kawa was a brief footnote in the book. And I learned in doing research for that footnote that Kawa left the church not long after the end of Brummer's mission. Turning to mission records, I read the report of an interview, not a transcript, but an interview somebody um, involved had written, in which Kawa was reported to have said that there should be two churches, a white church and a black church, and he would be the prophet of the black church. The report disclosed he had struggled with the idea that tithing should go to church headquarters instead of supporting, helping to support his own family, and his own family barely had enough to eat. He purportedly said that he initially contacted President Kimball to send missionaries to his people because his church needed money, especially money to buy drums, and the congregation still did not have drums. This story felt a little incomplete to me, and it puzzled me. Why did he work with white church members for several years before voicing his philosophy about a black church? Why would the man who so readily guided hundreds of believers from his church to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints suddenly leave over the issue of drums? Nonetheless, I wrote a brief footnote which included his defection from the church and his comment about being the black prophet. A few weeks later, I met with Judy Brummer to make sure one last time that I had the facts right in the introduction I had written to her talk. Although I felt dissatisfied with the Kawa footnote, in my mind it was also complete. Um, I, I had consulted the record and, and footnoted the record, and I did not plan to ask Judy about it. But while meeting with her, my troubled feelings about the footnote increased until I felt compelled to ask her about it. She had completed her mission before what I reported in the footnote, 
But still, I had to ask her about it. In response to my reading her the footnote, she told me that there had been a personality conflict between the person keeping the mission record and Bishop Kawa. She said she did not believe the translation between the man keeping the record and Bishop Kawa had been adequate at the time of their fateful interview. And she told me that Kawa was an exceptionally spiritual and humble person. I still do not know exactly what was said in that interview or intended in that interview, just as the interview participants themselves might not because of inadequate translation. But I feel I have a more true sense of who Cowell was and how to represent him in a footnote. Now that I have changed the footnote, my feelings about it are at rest. The story I have just described is a good eight times longer than the footnote. The footnote is a couple of sentences in a book that will be several hundred pages long. But this particular footnote mattered because it was a representation of a life that has not been extensively recorded. And despite the fact that I could not discover all of the fine details relevant to Bishop Kawa's later relationship to the church, I was spiritually guided to craft a representation of him that was truer to who he was than the one I additionally put together. I have come to believe that a crucial aspect of our work as historians is to represent people in ways true to who they were. There is holiness and responsibility in the work of telling a person's story. In conclusion, I would like to be able to describe exactly how and why our telling stories matters. I've tried to do so, alluding to Kanyaga's transformation when his flesh became word, or to the justice we hope to promote when we bring to light the records of past wrongs. But in truth, more is going on here than I am able to define. What I can do is to conclude with an observation that not only how we write about the dead, but which dead we write about, has a profound impact on the saving potential through which those dead can influence the living. I myself have been deeply affected by Mormon records, in particularly while working on the first 50 years of Relief Society, and I'm sorry that sounds self-promoting. I came to this project late, though. Half of the book had been written and most of the documents already chosen. And coming to it at that stage and still being able to research, write, edit, and spend time with the people whose stories it tells created in me a profound sense of the potential of the Relief Society organization, of the strength, resourcefulness, and dedication of my spiritual ancestors, and of the potential for members of my generation to do God's work and make this world better. A friend's mother, neither a scholar nor a reader of history, has been staying up late into the night to read this very scholarly, intensely footnoted book. My mother's neighbor, also not a habitual reader of history, says this is one of the most spiritual books she has ever read. We are affected by the stories in this book, not only because they are about women and we are women, but because we have not known women's contributions or read their words to the same extent that we have men's. My male colleagues have also been deeply moved by the records in the book. We need the histories of all of our people. I believe students of Mormon history will find ourselves similarly transformed as the kinds of history we read and write become more diverse in other ways, including broader racial perspectives. The more adeptly we cast our nets of research and writing, and the more inclusively, the better we contribute to a history that saves. honored and humbled uh, to be a part of this colloquium and a part of this panel in particular. I'm grateful to Jed and Lori for structuring it for us, and I'm especially grateful to Melissa and Kate. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a Mormon historian, particularly 
when it means sharing a panel with scholars such as this and to be moved by the stories that they shared in the way that I was moved. Thank you for allowing me to participate with you. I'm also grateful for the chance to express my gratitude to the people in this room who represent those uh, for whom um, my decision to be a historian uh, is uh, attributable, uh, to whom it's attributable. Um, my parents uh, are in this room. I'm grateful to them for teaching me to love history and thinking and reading. And um, Richard and Claudia Bushman are the other two people who are responsible for my decision to be a historian. So whatever praise or blame should be generated by my vocational choices belongs to them. And I'm grateful that they're in the same room today. Historians, I believe, have a dilemma. And few disciplinary genres illustrate our consensual solution to that dilemma quite like biography. And few forms of biography challenge that solution quite like writing the life of a prophet. To explore these theses is, both to, is to illuminate the challenges of our craft as historians and to recognize the particular work of Richard Bushman and I think to say something about the topic at the heart of this colloquium, namely the relationship of Mormonism and higher learning. From the late 18th century, the contested but unmistakable trend in Western historical writing has been toward an emphasis on the distinguishing particularities of each historical event. Echoing the words of one of his early modern subjects, Johann Gottfried Herder, who famously argued for the importance of, in, in Herder's German, individuell context in historical thinking, the intellectual historian Friedrich Meinecke described the effort to substitute, quote, a process of individualizing observation for a generalizing view of human forces in history. Thus began an intellectual trend toward the particularization of history that has gained momentum across the centuries. Indeed, today, the very phrase to think historically has come to mean thinking in terms of particularity. As R.G. Collingwood wrote in the mid-20th century, to think historically is to explore a world consisting of things other than myself, each of them an individual or unique agent in an individual or unique situation. In this disciplinary devotion to the particular, it would seem that biography offers the ultimate expression of our field's aspirations. What genre could possibly be, to use Herder and Meineke's term, more individuelle? When the American Historical Association recently published an essay on, quote, thinking historically, it offered biography, or as the essay put it, stories about individual lives, as one of the historical genres best suited to teaching students about the historicists' essential commitment to contingency. The idea that a life is shaped by a distinct causal chain of unpredictable events rather than by an overarching ahistorical telos. In this spirit, a so-called biographical turn has recently been lauded in certain historical subfields, ranging from the histories of the black Atlantic to those of modern American women. Looking for historians to counteract the influence of economists and sociologists and structuralist scholars of various stripes who write of slavery in terms of universal ahistorical categories, Joseph Miller has recently celebrated an emerging attention to biography in these terms. I welcome the epistemological implications of putting individuals and their experiences back where they belong at the base of our properly historical inquiry. Also citing a, quote, biographical turn in their, in their field, Marilyn Booth and Antoinette, Antoinette Burton have observed in a recent issue of the Journal of Women's History that contemporary scholarship tends to credit biography's capacity for getting at, quote, the contingent and the fragmentary and the historically discrete and specific processes of selving. In such arguments, biography seems like the ultimate end of our chronic quest for particularization. And yet, for all its potential to scratch our historicizing itch, as Booth and Burton both point out, biography also remains deeply suspect in the field. 
This suspicion comes from countervailing angles of critique. One source of suspicion for biography is that historians, for all our talk about particularity, are left unsatisfied by work that appears to be what we disdainfully call merely antiquarian interest, or that buys too fully into the mythical agency of the individual subject. That is, we see little value in particulars if they do not contribute to our understanding of bigger issues. To borrow an, alliter an alliterative phrase from the scholar of American religion, Lee Schmidt, biography promises portraits, but often strives to provide panoramas. Booth and Burton note that the same apologists for biography who tout its attention to the fragmentary, the specific, and the historically discreet also praise its ability, quote, to do more than simply illuminate individual lives. In his excellent recent essay on biography and Mormon studies, Matt Groh accepts as a matter of course that historiographic, historiographically respectable biography reaches outward to broad historical themes and answers a persistent call to, quote, contextualize its subjects within their larger cultural milieu. So while biography is lauded for its ability to particularize, it is simultaneously challenged to move beyond the purely particular. Indicative of this, the historian's dilemma, we also fear that this move outward to larger contexts may move too far in that direction. Indeed, biography by its very structure, based on a biological life cycle, has the potential to universalize its subject. Biography is an unavoidable reminder that even in a world of modern particularisms, all people are born, all die, and all live in between. Thus, from yet a third angle of critique, some historians argue that biographers risk invoking their subjects as emblems of universal truths about, un about human experience. Biographers, the historian of American religion, Catherine Breckis writes, have a tendency to collapse the difference between the past and the present universalizing their subjects' experiences instead of contextualizing them. For example, they might imply that Christians across time and space have been essentially alike in terms of their understanding of God. Or they might assume that their readers intuitively understand what it means to be a woman in early America as if the experience of womanhood has always been the same. In such critiques, the biographical subject threatens to stand in for the universal human, Thus, we fear that the most particularized of historical approaches may, if taken to its logical end, result in the opposite intellectual effect. From this perspective, historicism, historicism looks to be locked in a kind of Sisyphean effort with biography at the crest of the hill, a point where something resembling particularistic purity might either go too far or not far enough, indeed seems predestined to go too far or not far enough and thus either tumbles down on one side into universalizing assumptions or down the other into atomized irrelevance. The discipline's attitude toward biography has thus been persistently ambivalent. Precisely because it so clearly elicits expressions of these countervailing concerns that plague the work of historians, biography has also been especially illustrative of a shared disciplinary solution. Note that both those who fear biography as overly specific and those who fear it as excessively universalizing call for the same solution, the quote, contextualizing or the contextualization of the subject. Contextualization, an indistinct effort that can expand or contract as needed, promises to keep the historicizing boulder from falling too far in either direction. It both particularizes and renders the particular relevant. Context, at least as historians invoke it, seems flexible enough to be just about whatever we want it to be, so long as it is, not, it is neither too atomized nor too universalized as we define those terms. Our arguments about biography make especially clear the perceived threats from which contextualization promises to save us and also our easy confidence in the power of contextualization. The struggle between the exceptional subject and the universal claim is not purely a problem of modern historiography by any means. There has been, for instance, a parallel di dilemma in Christ modern Christian theology. How does a historically particular exceptional story like the life of Jesus Christ accurately capture the eternal truths of a universal God? Not coincidentally, this theological scandal of particularity 
emerged in Western thought at the same moment when history, embracing its uh, empiricist tendencies, began to celebrate its ability to particularize. In the 18th century, Gotthold Lessing spoke of the scandal of particularity as, quote, the ugly broad ditch from which he determined that accidental truths of history can never be proof of necessary truths of reason. In the 19th century, thinkers ranging from Soren Kierkegaard to Theodore Parker confronted the same problem, with Kierkegaard ambiv ambivalently posing the question, can an eternal happiness be built on historical knowledge, and Parker unambiguously answering that no, it could not. Parker sought instead a faith of universally intuitable truths that were, in his words, quote, independent of historical documents. The effort to address this constant Christian collision between historical particularity and eternal universality continued. Appropriately so, it continued between Terrell Givens and Bob, Bob Goldberg this morning. So uh, it's continued into the 20th and into the 21st century, where one of the most elegant answers came from the Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who along with others believed that this intractable problem was only solved in the traditional Trinitarian incarnation of Christ, where the universal eternal father and the particular historical Jesus emerged as one. This was mirrored in the work of biblical scholars who drew on long-standing Christian traditions to see in Jesus the pivot point between the particular covenant of Abraham and the universalizing preaching of Paul. Historically human and eternally divine, God of Israel and Lord of all nations, particular and universal, Jesus Christ not only redeemed us from sin in his modern incarnation, he promised to deliver us from the great intellectual dilemma of our age, that between the historically particular and the universally true. In the case of Balthazar's theology of the incarnation, such understandings have proved very valuable to his readers, some of whom use them to protect universal truth against the corrosive influence of modern relativism, and some of whom use it to particularize the biblical revelation as a necessarily perspectival approach to truth. Thus, in the doctrine of the incarnation, Christ lays him himself down as the answer to modernity's characteristic struggle between what Isaiah Berlin called the one and the many. Here then we might perceive a point of comparison between the main thrust of modern historiographical thinking and a certain strand of Christian incarnational theology. They both address the challenges of particularity and universality. Yet there is a fundamental difference. Context and Christ may both be invoked as solutions to a shared problem, but they do not actually do the same work. The historiographical insistence on context is largely driven by a suspicion about both the exceptional individual and the universal claim. The Christian appeal to the incarnation is shaped by a determination to believe in both. One seeks to address the dilemma by diminishing its competing terms, the other by sacralizing them. What is one to do then when writing the biography of a prophet? By definition, an exceptional individual, also a historical person produced by a surrounding context, and also one who is supposed to be the conduit of eternal and universal truths. Discussions of prophetic parentage, which have recurred frequently, illustrate the challenge. In 1850, when Ralph Waldo Emerson published his collection of revised lectures on representative men, he looked to express the critique that Emanuel Swedenborg had failed to escape fully the pull of his particular context. A crack at Swedenborg's identity as the child of a Swedish cleric served Emerson well. The Lutheran, the Lutheran bishop's son, for whom the heavens are opened, with all these grandeurs resting upon him, remains the Lutheran bishop's son. His judgments are those of a Swedish polemic, and his vast enlargements are purchased by adamantine limitations. When the famed American Swedenborgian George Bush, progenitor of future American presidents, heard Swedenborg described as remaining a Lutheran bishop's son, he fully caught Emerson's implication and felt compelled to respond. He refused to let the sage of Concord suggest that Swedenborg taught a localized truth. Either Swedenborgianism was eternally true, Bush asserted, or it was false in any part of the universe. Emerson's and Bush's choice of words underscored an assumption to be from a particular place, to have particular parents, was in some sense to be tacitly disqualified from the prophet's presumed obligation to the universe. In the New Testament, this assumption took the form of a simple, devastating question. Is not this Joseph's son? 
An especially striking example of this prophetic impasse appears in Mary Baker Eddy's autobiography, Retrospection and Introspection, in which she provides her readers with the historical specifics of her life, including stories of her immediate parents and other ancestors, while repeatedly reminding the reader that such historical specifics are meaningless in the pursuit of eternal truths. God alone is our origin, she writes at the end of her description of her own parentage. The father and mother of every person are the one spirit, and his brethren are all the children of one parent. As Eddie's autobiographical ambivalence suggests, the prophet, the figure who occupies a place in history in order to point a way toward eternity, the child of earthly parents serving the eternal parent, stands at the intersection of converging forces. The biography of a prophet marks a distinctive collision point of both theological and historiographical conversations about universals, particulars, and contexts. Richard Bushman's own scholarly autobiography suggests a long-term resolve to function within that tense zone of convergence. The Inner Joseph Smith, an article written for the Journal of Mormon History a year after the appearance of Rough Stone Rolling, includes Bushman's reflections on an interest in psychohistory that he cultivated early in his career. Tellingly, as a young historian, Bushman had been drawn to a methodology that promised to grant a certain historiographical gravitas to both the psychological particularities of unique individuals and the general, one might say universal, diagnostic categories in which those particularities might be understood. Bushman grasped early and eagerly at an approach that could be intellectually respectable and still make room for exceptional, exceptional figures and widely shared truths of human experience. For luminaries like Benjamin Franklin and Jonathan Edwards, Bushman had explained much by way of their filial ties, Franklin's particular relationship with an earthly mother and Edwards's particular conceptions of a heavenly father. But Bushman was never quite satisfied with the results of these approaches to secular figures, to the extent that Edwards is a secular figure. To appeal to the impact of one's parents was still an act of excessive particularization on one hand and of diagnostic universalization on the other, and thus unable to explain the enormous cultural influence these men exercised in the in-between. Bushman had sought, and at least by his own assessment, which we might push back on, failed to match the work of Eric Erickson, who had successfully made the individual psyches of Luther and Gandhi emblematic of the conditions of their time and place and therefore more explanatory of their tremendous impact on their age. Bushman knew from early on that contextualization offered an important answer, but he could not match Erickson's comfortable resolution, his peace with the solution. Almost in spite of himself, however, Bushman's quest continued. He could not let psychohistory go precisely because his recurring work, eventually on a prophetic life, would not let him abandon robust considerations of the individual and the universal. As the inner Joseph Smith shifts from those early days to reflections on rough stone rolling, we catch a glimpse of the mature Bushman's continu continuing resolve a determination to let cultural context do its intellectual work of illumination without fully accepting its invitation to a fair and easy way out of the paradoxes of a prophet's life. He had, by the time of rough stone rolling, clearly achieved a certain comfort, comfort with those conflicts. In that biography, Bushman demonstrates his willingness to train his scholarly attention in multiple directions, into the historical particulars of Smith's individual home, specifically his psychologically charged relationship with his father, but also pulling the analysis back out from there to talk about the ways in which Smith's pursuit of familial security for himself and patriarchal dignity for his father led to revelations that spoke to the psychological needs of an entire generation of disrupted and displaced American families. Thus far, Bushman successfully follows the lead of Erickson in letting individual psychic appetites sustain generational analyses. But because of Smith's claims to transcendent truths and because of Bushman's personal investment in those claims, he still will not rest with Erickson's contextual deliverance. Quote, does it detract from the divinity of a revelation for it to resolve personal and social problems? Bushman asks in that essay. In this simple rhetorical query, which invokes the personal, the social, and the divine. We see the three levels of analysis for which Bushman has created space, a father, 
many fathers, the Father. To give all three a place in the story of a prophetic figure's life is to accept the good work that context does, but to refuse its offer to obviate the demands of the individual and the universal. That resistance to easy resolution, a certain persistent discordance that seemed to trouble him in the stories that he told about Franklin and Edwards, seems easier for him to live with in the life of Joseph Smith. For half a century of scholarly work, Bushman has wrestled with this dilemma of the particular and the universal, exceptional figures and common human experiences. As a committed historian, he has embraced the explanatory power of contextualization and its ability to tame the two poles of our dilemma, allowing that commitment to pull him back from what he perceived to be the deficiencies of his early psychohistorical work. But as a tenacious believer in both exceptional individuals and universal truths, he has refused ultimate satisfaction with contextualization's claims to sufficiency. He has graciously accepted its illuminations, but not, but not its absolutions, standing resolutely at that intersection where historiographical and theological anxieties most conspicuously collide. In this process, he has offered us a certain intellectual humility, a certain comfort with, appreciation of, but ultimately a challenge to the easy comfort and confidence in this thing that we call context and its ability to count for all the things in the human experience. And his peace with that place, with this resolution, and his deafness of touch amidst its conflicting demands seemed to reach a peak in his work on a prophet, a figure whom he could concede up front that after particular parents and cultural context were all given their due, a remainder would maddeningly, marvelously endure. Good afternoon. I always see people reading off their computers and somehow I always get worried that something's gonna flash off, but so far so good. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to have been able to read and sit with these papers for several weeks and think about them. Um, when I first received them, I took it as my task to guess what the conference planner saw as the connective tissue that ran through all of them. Um, but I, then I realized that actually all the papers for the conference had the same connective tissue, so um, perhaps I was looking too hard. It may well be that because I was coming fresh off of the Mormon History Association conference in which practice was the organizing rubric, I immediately saw that theme here in the reflections of Melissa, Kate, and David. Each one of them worries about the distinctive challenges of linking the practice of history with the faith of the scholar. But another concept keeps appearing in these papers, even when it is not stated explicitly, and that is what we might call accountability or even obligation. Accountability provides an organizing framework by which each author judges the kinds of historical practices he or she employs. Each one also contributes, I think, a particular strand to the story. Melissa focuses our attention on teaching and the mutual obligations that the student-teacher relationship generates. Kate explores the relationship invoked between the living and the dead as historians craft their narratives. David questions the appropriate balance between particularity and universality in the writing of biography. Taken together, these papers offer a number of promising ways to explore what we are doing when we practice history, be it in the classroom or in print. And so I'm gonna raise just a few questions for each of them in turn and quickly try to get us onto our uh, Q&A time. First of all, Melissa describes the ways that her Mormon identity shapes her teaching. Her goal, as she says, is to get students to think broadly and carefully about basic questions of meaning and human value. The ways that she does, does so are shaped by her Mormon beliefs in a number of ways. Her socialization into hierarchical pastoral structures shape her sense of mutual obligation in the classroom, with a little Buddhism thrown in there, I think. Her expectations for student learning are informed by belief in the eternal value of learning and growth. And third, practicing Mormonism has made her comfortable with messy contradictions and unresolved tensions in human communities. Now, my main question for you, Melissa, is how well this formulation works in a non-church context where students don't necessarily share your commitments to hierarchy, 
for one, although some of them are more respectful than, than I would uh, uh, dare to believe sometimes to um, authorities in the classroom. But um, there seems to be a translation issue that's going on here between a church context and a classroom context. Now, I don't know, you didn't talk much about your students. I'm assuming they're not all LDS students, right? So what does the sense of mutual obligation mean when you are teaching non-Mormon students in that context? Does inculcating those expectations require you to spell out the Mormon pastoral context? Or do you find another idiom for talking about this dynamic with them? How do you socialize them into this kind of dynamic? And if your work is in part to help them become who they want to be, I think that's the way you put it, how do you train them to have this expectation of themselves? Creating the kind of dynamic you describe in your classroom is a real art, and I want to hear more about how you bring your students along with you on this journey. A second set of questions that I have for you revolve around the role of history in the learning process. Much of what you describe, it seems to me, pertains to the process of learning generally considered. What difference does this subject matter make, though? Does history make? And why can it achieve the goals you describe better than other subjects might? Or can it? Why history? One of the points that I take from your talk, and this is just sort of, I, I think I'm pulling a, a thread and seeing if there's what, what it's attached to. One of the points that I take from your talk is that history in particular offers students new possibilities in their lives at an especially opportune moment. I love your point that college age students um, are already face what you call a whirlwind of doors to countless futures constantly swinging open and shut. Was that your line? That's a great line. <laughs> Um, a whirlwind of doors. Um, this, it's a terrific insight, it seems to me, and it causes me uh, to wonder whether history can be used to take full advantage of this life phase in some particular way. Can we employ historical narratives to help them make sense, the students make sense of their own decisions? Or is our job simply to show them the doorways? Another way of putting this, where does the critical faculty come into play? Are we just there to show them the doors? Or are we there to, to help them decide which doors are the right ones to walk through? Um, so that's sort of the, mor the, the moral leading of the question. Finally, your celebration of messiness is near and dear to my own style of looking for outliers and contradictions. You know that already. I wonder, though, how we might put this in conversation with David's focus on persistent discordance in, discordance in the aims of history itself. Is messiness always a good thing? How does this square with the desire to find absolute meaning, David's universal level in history? I'm struck especially by your concluding statement that Mormons are good at living with untidiness and even better bridge builders or translators. Now, I think this is one strand of the Mormon story, but I also see, as, I, as you know, such a st strong centripetal tendency that moves towards standardization, orderliness, and absolute meaning. So what are we to do with the, with the messiness in the face of those ordering tendencies. So that might be another kind of contradiction we want to play with. Community and collective obligation also figure prominently in Kate's paper. She encourages us to focus on the work of history, family history especially, as in itself sacramental. History as sacrament. It forges a connection between the living and the dead and calls on individuals to fulfill obligations to others by telling their stories. And it also, as she puts it, saves those who are living by providing hope and companionship. In order to be saved, Kate tells us, the historian must pres preserve an accurate and inclusive range of their stories. This is a lovely reflection on accountability in our writing, something that can be very easy to forget. So I thank you for the reminder, Kate, that studying past lives can put us in conversation with people in different eras. In the Mormon context, as you point out, these discussions beyond the veil have a particular salience. But I wonder whether it isn't true more generally for many scholars. You never know who you'll be face to face with in the afterlife, Mormon or not. Uh, I will never, I mean, I have sort of a story, a his, history story myself about this. I will never forget, and I think many historians have these stories, I'll, I'll never forget poring over the diary of a Protestant missionary in the archives when I was working on my dissertation, reading through years of his life in California with his beloved wife, including the story at the end of the diary of her tragic death, which just about did me in when I read it. Then I was putting the diary back in the, the big box uh, that contained uh, these artifacts from him. I reached into the box, and inside the box were, were her wedding slippers. And it was just one of those moments, and we, we have all had those moments with artifacts or objects if we're historians, 
uh, an incredibly humbling moment of discovery when you're brought face to face with the humanity of your subject. So I'll come back to this, but I'm, I want to hear more from you about what's, what's specifically Mormon about that encounter for you. Um, but there are also problems with stories because unfortunately <laughs> they are rarely straightforward and rarely only decipherable in one way. And this is re where the really vexing work, as you know, starts. Kate gives us a number of evocative ways of describing this historical practice, and it is here that I want to probe a little further with some questions. What does it mean in practice to tell someone's story, to provide an accurate record? These are phrases you use in your piece. To provide an accurate record, to heal and redeem one's subjects, to tell their story the way they would tell it. To represent it, does this also mean to represent it using our own standards of justice and judgment? And then worst of all, what if it is a story that we don't like or a person that we don't like very much? How do we tell that story? To what extent is this kind of storytelling, as you also put it, a new creation, as the phrase making the flesh word might indicate? Something new is, coming, is being born and coming into being, which seems to indicate more authority on the part of the historian than some of these other phrases. There's so much messiness in figuring out what constitutes a life, so much that seems contradictory or confusing, and so much that requires us to choose what is important and unimportant as we sift through evidence and accounts. The fact that Richard Bushman's work is a jumping off point for this conference seems perfectly appropriate, I think, since in his own magnificent biography of Joseph Smith Jr., he too sought to tell someone's story. And this proved to be really, really difficult and not straightforward at all and not everyone agreed that he had gotten it right. What happens then for all of us when the obligation is serious and compelling to tell the story, but you aren't sure exactly what that means? So I'd welcome your wisdom and conversation as we all sort of struggle with some of these basic questions about that. This also takes us to the issue of audience. And Kate, again, does a lovely job of noting the obligations when doing historical work within and for a community of faith. I wonder then, does this context, or should this context, change the shape of our accounts? I don't think that historians in general talk enough about who they are writing for or why they are really writing. So it's refreshing and helpful to hear you reflect on why you are doing this work and what you hope it will accomplish for you, for those departed or voiceless others, and for a religious community. But we can expand that, I think, for all of us to, to ask those questions as well. Finally, turning to David's paper, I'm struck, uh, David, that you also use the word saving in your title. There's a lot of saving going on here. Uh, but here you're speaking of the saving grace of context. And you turn our attention much more closely to biography. Although I think Kate's comments also get it, the biographical form in many respects. Uh, David points to another historical problem that biography presents for us. How to narrate the particularity of a single life without falling into antiquarianism on the one hand or complete universalism on the other. Now, just as a side note, it's interesting, too, that this historical task is qualitatively different from that undertaken by Kate, who seeks, seeks to particularize the experiences of the previously voiceless. In fact, uh, part of the sacrality of that act, as you describe it, Kate, is, the, is given dis giving distinctiveness and detail to it. And I wonder, I would love to hear the conversation between the two of you about whether that's a good thing or whether that's just antiquarian. Um, now, my first point for you, David, is an observation. Kate's paper claims that the telling of the individual life story is valuable, even wholly, in and of itself. Yet you point out that this kind of thinking is, in the larger world of scholarship, not a typical way of thinking about the value of biography. So I wonder where you yourself find your religious commitments fitting with these disciplinary standards as you've described them. You also do a really nice job of showing how, how Richard Bushman creates space for the personal, the social, and the divine in the life of Joseph Smith, Jr. And you contrast this to the uneasiness with which he earlier treated Franklin and Edwards and how he felt easier living with a potential discordance in Smith's account. It seems to me that, that Richard also wrestled with a different dilemma in writing about Smith. For Joseph Smith was not, for Bushman, the existential equal of Franklin or Edwards. He meant something different. So how then was the dilemma of historiography and sacrality transformed by his subject matter and his own relationship to it? This is the point that Kate's paper in particular drives us to. 
How does our own relationship to our subject sacralize the historian's task? Richard wasn't just writing about a prophet, he was writing about his prophet. How does that matter? David also eloquently disentangles the strands of historical thinking, I think. But history, as Kate also points out, serves various purposes that are more elided in David's account. So does it matter that Richard Bushman was writing for, at least in part, an LDS audience? What difference did audience make there? Does that make his task different from that of, of the secular historians who you refer to in the piece? And finally, uh, I think for, for you all to think about, and, and uh, I'll raise this because I am not only not from Harvard, but I am not LDS, so I'm a double outsider on this panel. What is particularly Mormon about these ways of teaching or writing? Both Melissa and Kate, I think, make a strong case that their self-understanding is refracted through the lens of their faith. And Richard Bushman certainly articulates those linkages elegantly in, in his own writings. Yet I wonder how many of these questions and concerns are more universal. Historians constantly struggle with issues of obligation and accountability. I also wonder um, if we, whether we should follow more clearly the path that David is setting out before us. Can we find analogies in other religious traditions that can help Mormons gain purchase on the problems of history? We so often, I think, in Mormon history take an exceptionalist perspective. Well, this is our problem. This is, a, this is a Mormon history problem. In fact, there are, are people, as, as David's paper suggests, in other, uh, uh, other religious traditions who have struggled with some of these same questions. And it would be interesting at least uh, to do some kind of comparative work in that case. The issue of audience uh, also brings us to insider-outsider questions. Who are we writing for? How do we pay attention to disparate voices? The stakes of history within a faith context are very different than they are outside of it. There are different ep epistemological premises involved in each one, and I would welcome conversations that would illuminate that comparison. Thank you. We'd like to thank all of our uh, presenters today. This has been a wonderful session. I think we should give each of the presenters a chance to answer the questions that Larry has posed. I think they could probably take up the balance of the Q&A time, but we don't want to do that. So we'll ask you all to answer her questions in 30 seconds each, if you would. <laughs> no, just kidding. But in reality, maybe a, two minutes only. Um, so let's start with uh, Melissa. Let me just restate as I understood the questions. Um, Laurie, first asked you about um, your obligation to your non-LDS students and how you translate your Mormon identity to them and whether that is uh, translatable to them. She also asked about the function of history in the learning process, why history, um, and then finally, the messiness of, of what you do is messiness always a good thing uh, in what you, uh, how you teach. Uh, thank you for these very thought-provoking comments. You know, actually, in my two years of teaching at the University of Auckland, I've only had one Mormon student. So I wouldn't say that I'm translating my Mormon identity to them, but I am a Mormon and I am their teacher. So that's what they get. They just get a Mormon teacher. Um, for example, um, we just, I just ask questions. Um, obviously, they're not questions like, you know, as a... I ask just basic questions, but they have to do with meaning, and I, I feel like those are important questions and okay to ask them in the classroom. And you're right, it's not just Mormon academics who ask questions about meaning of their students. Um, so, for example, you know, we're talking about the um, establishment of the Communist Party in the 1930s and how they're creating this society. And, you know, we talk about how Mao established boxes um, where people could inform on one another very conveniently. They just like write down you know, their critiques and put it in the box and you know, for people who had incorrect political views or suspicious behavior. And then I ask, did this system encourage moral behavior? So, so we just ask questions like that. Was Mao a good person? You know, we read a variety of perspectives on Mao that talk about how he was great, horrible, then all these other things in between. Um, why history? The... Um, uh, I think history, you're right, history is important because it's about um, the lives of others, right? And um, you know, I teach, I tell the students, you know, th through this class, especially a modern Chinese history class in which these incredible, you know, incredibly difficult things are 
are happening in China, revolution, war, invasion, famines, floods, all these kinds of things. Um, from the experiences of people in China, we learn that life is wonderful, painful, beautiful, and hard. And I tell them, as you keep on living, you will learn this from your own experiences until one day your life, too, is somebody else's history. Um, the third question, is messiness always a good thing? No, but um, I didn't say that uh, I think this, this um, Mormon academics are particularly good at dealing with messiness. Um, and I think that being able to process things that aren't always tidy, are, is a, um, that ability is, is very helpful. Um, and it's, it's good to be able to be productively address those tensions and contradictions instead of being paralyzed by them because life is messy. Um, the, I'll, I'll just try to finish very quickly since I've only been given two minutes. Um, exceptionalism, you know, are Mormons really so different from other historians? Probably not. It's hard to make those distinctions, right? Um, I don't know if um, the way that I am as a teacher is actually heavily influenced by my Mormonism. I, mean, I, I have no way of figuring that out, but it is what I do and it is who I am. So as I understand it, Laurie is asking at least three questions to Kate. One is about uh, what is this question of what is particularly Mormon about encounters with um, or, or writing about the dead. The second question is about uh, what does it mean to tell someone's story and uh, is it desirable to always tell the story that someone would want told about themselves? Do they understand themselves as well as we might understand themselves or what parts of their lives do we understand that they might not fully understand, and vice versa? And then the, the last question is the, the overarching question of audience and um, how, um, how the audience shapes the kind of account we write. I'm not going to answer all of those questions. Um, I will in the, in the longer version of the essay, so read, read the book. Um, but I wanted to say that I was particularly grateful to you for making me see what was in the back of my head while I was writing, but I didn't know how to deal with it, so I just repressed it. And, and, and that was the question of what makes my Mormon historian experience different from that of another, another historian who believes in an afterlife. And, and so part of me is going to investigate and try to ask questions about that, but part of me thinks we maybe need to rethink of the boundaries that, that we're using. Maybe the difference is between a, a historian who's, who's sensitive to what in, in the black church we talk about as a cloud of witnesses, the real presence of uh, the dead in the, around and in the lives of the living, and, uh, and maybe there's a category of people who believe in an afterlife and believe that you meet people in the afterlife, and then maybe there's a category of people who don't, and the experience of writing history as one of those people is, is different. So I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm glad you understand that you don't need to clap after the comment here. So. <laughs> Even though we wanted to clap, Kate, it felt, felt like. We wanted to do that. Um, okay, so finally for David, uh, Laurie asks about saving grace and especially his own uh, religious commitment and how he balances that against the larger professional commitment um, or appraisal of biography. Uh, secondly, she asks about the transformation or the uh, um, sacralization of uh, Joseph Smith versus Franklin and what difference that makes. And then she also asked about the question of audience uh, with biography. Um, first of all, in reference to, uh, to the title and, and the phrase saving grace, it was actually intended somewhat ironically because I don't think context does ultimately save us from the historian's dilemma, uh, though it gets us uh, an admirable way down that path. 
Um, so uh, so the, the salvific power of context, I think, is too easily embraced by members of our guild. Uh, and one of the things I appreciate about Richard Bushman's work is it invites us to question that comfort a little bit. Um, and that, that speaks, uh, Laurie posed this question about the relationship between Kate's paper and mine uh, and asked whether the, the kinds of highly particularized personal stories that Kate recovers and tells so wonderfully well um, violate uh, the, the sort of binary that I, that I set out in the paper. I also like to make clear that, that the, the claim that those kinds of stories are of, quote, merely antiquarian interest uh, is, is not my claim. Um, in part because I actually believe in a universal human family. Uh, and I actually believe that those stories are my stories in a way, that we are part of the same story. Uh, and I think that's a commitment that Richard Bushman shares, and that's one of the ways I think he challenges the, the binary that we would otherwise set up. Um, and why sometimes a larger context isn't necessary for us to appreciate the power of a particularized story. Um, and then finally, this, this question of, um, of Richard's uh, treatment of Joseph Smith versus his treatment of Franklin and Edwards and how that might relate to, to our treatments of other figures. I, I will say this, um, what I hoped to convey in this paper is that Richard Bushman has liberated me as a historian who is now working on other people's prophets. I'm, I'm writing a book on Mary Baker Eddy and Ellen White, the founders respectively of Christian Science and Seventh-day Adventism. And in treating his prophet, Richard has created space for that remainder, something beyond the contextual explanation for these remarkable figures. And even though these are not my prophets, I feel empowered by his example and by his work to create similar space for them. That I can, in fact, appreciate the exceptionality and the wondrousness of these prophetic women, even if I don't share their theology or joining their movement. But that he has set an example of how one responsibly and respectfully engages a prophet. Uh, and leaves room for things that might lie beyond the historian's go-to explanatory tools. And I'm happy to be able to apply that to other people's prophets as well. So we have about five minutes for questions. I think we'll go ten minutes. So we'll go five minutes beyond the session, uh, and then we'll have ten minutes to visit. Uh, in between sessions. So if you have a question for anyone on the panel, uh, go ahead and come to the front here and um, speak into the microphone and please speak loudly. I think um, I won't need to repeat the question if you just speak into the microphone. Thanks. This is a question for David and it's a weird question. So let me apologize in advance, but for the last six months, I've been obsessively listening to the soundtrack from Hamilton. <laughs> and the, the show is, is very historically self-conscious about the writing and telling of history and what it is that we want to take from history. And first of all, you know, I'm struck by the completely unexpected nature that this uh, forgotten founding father, as he's called in the show, has suddenly become such a cultural icon, and I would really like to hear what you have to say about that. But thinking about, you know, extrapolating that into Mormon culture, when we look at something like Hamilton, we can see that it ingeniously meets the needs of today uh, for understanding the role of immigrants in society or women or African Americans, that it has become this cultural touchstone for those reasons. So in Mormon history, who are the people in our past whose stories have not been told, who would be cultural touchstones for us as we're grappling with this era in which we find ourselves? So 
I need to say, Jana, that my only experience with Hamilton is foolishly and naively thinking I could get tickets four months in advance <laughs> for my anniversary, uh, only to realize they're 18 months uh, in advance booked. So, uh, so I can't speak too directly um, to, to Hamilton, um, but I, I do appreciate, I bought, I've been fascinated by uh, Hamilton since long before he became a, a cultural phenomenon. Um, and I think in part that's because we are gratified by the surprises of history, as you put it. Um, I think, you know, Hamilton is often set in this um, juxtaposition with Jefferson, and Jefferson for a long time seemed like the easier American hero to respect, but today is very difficult to respect uh, in lots of ways, at least for me. Um, and Hamilton as his foil uh, offers us uh, an alternative, a challenge. And, uh, and I think we appreciate that, um, at least I do. Who, who in our own history um, w would play a similar role? I really have to make recourse to, to Kate's paper again, which is to suggest that in the process of doing what we are all under divine obligation to do, which is to recover the stories of unknown people who may in fact be biologically connected to us, but as family history extends those you know, uh, biological ties get more and more tenuous, and, and yet we're still in this process of recovering nameless, storyless people. And those are the people that I find most, um, most meaningful in, in my own spiritual, religious life. It's not the ones who become a Broadway hit. It's the people that I discover through just confession here, through my son's family history work, since I'm not very good at it myself. Um, but recently discovered a man and a woman who are buried uh, about five miles from my home uh, that I did not know about. They live in Westford, Massachusetts, and they are the progenitors of my mother's great-grandmother. Um, and I've been in the process of recovering their stories, and they are the people who inspire me. I'm not going to suggest that they should inspire anyone else. I don't talk about them from the pulpit. Uh, the, the, their stories are for, for me and my family, but they're the ones that inspire me. So Kate's kinds of stories are the stories that I find most meaningful in my own religious life. This is a question for both uh, Melissa and Kate. I'm trying to bring forward a thread that was, um, uh, I guess, established to some degree about the international aspect of church history. And let me, let me put the question in this way. Some of the questions are rhetorical, but I think you'll see the thread. Um, and it's because you both spoke about non-US dimensions to both history and, and, and teaching, bringing forward Mormon history. How important is Mormon history? Is Mormon history in America as important to Mormons as Brazil, in Brazil or anywhere else? as it is to Mormons in America. Will Mormon history in Brazil be as important to Mormons in Brazil as Mormon history in America is to Mormons in America? Will the same kind of history of the Mormons in Brazil need to be done as is being done with the Mormon history in America? I was intrigued by the realization not stunning, but I guess self-evident that the results of the Joseph Smith Papers project won't be internationalized, won't be translated. It's just too much to ask. And you reflect it's a huge investment of effort and will and faith. And then how do you extrapolate from that? What will history, Mormon history, mean in light of this experience to others whose lives you two in particular have reached out and touched and to some degree articulated. Hope that wasn't too rhetorical and hope not entirely irrelevant to this session today. Thank you. I'm glad you asked because this is something I think about a lot. And, and at the Church History Library, we now have centers where, um, so if you're in an African country, then you're the history of your ward, or if you write a history, then that will be at the repository in Africa instead of in the repository in Salt Lake City. And I think that's a really important shift, but I hope that it doesn't mean what you are suggesting is that we end up studying only the histories of our own countries, because I really believe there's so much to learn about being human 
and about making the world function in a more peaceful way if we read each other's histories and, and not just histories, but current stories and experiences. So hopefully that's somewhat of an answer there. Uh, Fred, I actually asked your very question to um, my bishop in New Zealand before I left. And I just, you know, offered my service. I said, you know, I do Mormon history, so if you ever need anyone who, you know, if you're the, the youth are having issues or whatever, you know, I can talk about it. And he's like, ow, oh, we don't really care about U.S. history. We're tired of hearing about it. It's like all those places, you know, there's like this place, they go to this place, they go to that place, they go to this place. You know, we want to hear about our own New Zealand history. That's what he said. I'd like to ask a question kind of combining Janice's question and the last question about, universe, about the International Church. Um, I too have been listening to the Hamilton soundtrack lots. <laughs> and I think the thing that makes it exciting is that you have, it represents um, people from a variety of backgrounds. You know, you've got uh, Aaron Burr is black and you know, different ethnicities, all claiming the genius of the American experiment. They all get to celebrate it. It's not just white men. It's everyone gets to celebrate that. So to what extent in the writing of Mormon history is there a way for us to say that uh, all our ethnicities, you know, all our backgrounds, all our different perspectives can still celebrate um, the genius and the insight of the Restoration? Um, how can we do that in the same way Hamilton brings that all in to celebrate the American experience? Is that what history should be about? Can we do that? What do you think? I'm under the bus. <laughs> Catherine, I'm not sure I followed exactly what you were getting at, but it, it sounded like it was something about the beauty of the multiplicity of voices and, and flipping of, of race and relationship in the Hamilton production. And the, and the founding of America. How does that compare to what historians are doing? Uh, so it's not just so it's not just Hamilton and Hamilton and international people studying American history. Uh, what relevance does that have to them? What relevance does the story the pioneers have? But yet somehow recapturing uh, what the restoration means and making it relevant to various people with various different backgrounds internationally, genders, race, sexual orientation. How can we recapture, you know, the excitement of the restoration the same way that Hamilton captures that excitement of the American experience for a variety of ethnicities? Um, there we go. I, I, I don't know that that's something we can intentionally set out to do, but uh, something meaningful to me once I was, when I was new in my job and I was wondering about uh, what would happen uh, when some of the things I was working on came out and I think I was trying to, I wanted to have some sort of control over it or something because I felt responsible for it and, and had a chance to ask El Elder Holland this question and he said, you do the best work that you can and then you let it out there and he had a beautiful metaphor about how like water it will go where it needs to go to the seeds that it needs, needs to find. Um, I, I, and I, I think the only other thing I would want to say here is um, we often say American history and we're not adequately at all telling our American history or our American Mormon history yet in, in the Mormon studies field. And um, we have native peoples um, from different tribes who are Mormon whose, whose stories really aren't being told. We have people with disabilities whose stories are not yet um, very often being told. Um, and and one of the tensions that I was thinking of while David was speaking, although I don't think this is what he was getting at, was it's so important to have different stories told and to connect to those stories and connect to those histories. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes it gets so that we're, it seems like the, maybe the consumers of history are saying, where's my history? And they're complaining if they don't see their history. And, and, 
and it becomes a, sort of a selfish relationship with history in, in some ways. So I, I, don't, I don't know that this is making much sense, but I, I, I hope that in our call for inclusive history, we're not only looking for, for our own history, but we're looking um, to really understand um, that at the human experience, the human trial, and, and, and human salvation as we're um, going about this work. Before we break, I'd like to just venture an answer to Catherine's question. So at the LDS Church History Department, one of the things that we talk about often is the difference between a trunk story and the difference and a branch story. What is the difference between a trunk and a branch? And a trunk story is something where um, lots of different saints from different people, uh, different countries or different backgrounds somehow have a tie into the trunk and that there's some kind of universality, I mean, going back to David's paper, uh, about that experience. And one area I think that is most obvious is the pioneering experience. So it's particular in that it's Utah, it's Salt Lake, um, the, the quest to arrive in Zion. And yet, is it really particular? It's sort of universal because lots of different saints have their own pioneering story, and every country indeed has its own pioneering people who have to uh, go out into that country as being uh, some of the initial members of that country. And what is that experience like? How is it um, to be a Mormon in, surrounded by people who don't believe as you do? Uh, I, I think there's a universality in many of those experiences then the next question becomes, how do you choose who gets represented? I think it goes back to Kate's question. Every country has its pioneers, and there isn't enough space, so who do you pick? Um, and I think uh, some of those questions regard, well, who has the most dramatic story? Who has a, a narrative um, that is compelling, for example, um, that has abundant detail? So that gets back to the age-old question of what a historian does, how you practice history. You find accounts um, that are rich, effulgent, that have a lot that you can work with. And hopefully in that, um, you don't just privilege elite people who, can, who write well, but you can somehow recover the voices of lots of different people um, through those accounts that are left over. So anyway, I think um, there, there are different ways that we're doing that right now, and I think um, you know, we'll continue to do, to do that, uh, certainly at the Church History Department, but I think the scholars on our panel today are doing it right before our eyes. Thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes until the, the next session begins. So, um, oh, five minutes now? Sorry, you've been listening to me. Uh, so go ahead and break, and we'll meet back here at 3.15.